have about half an hour until my bus comes. I could go all the way to the end of the trail, but then I would probably miss the bus. So I stopped here. And so yeah, I'll do a bit of a video. I called Hardy Nutritionals today and told them about the anxiety I was having over the weekend. And they said that's pretty normal. And they said I could take more of the vitamin C. So today I'm planning on taking three at least, and I could go up more. It's kind of expensive, but they said it's only temporary, so maybe for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So to me, that's worth it. And then they told me to read this document they have on their website about things that can limit the process. And I read through it, and the stuff that can apply to me is that I do like to go rollerblading and I was planning to start that sprinting a few times a week thing but exercise can actually speed up the detox process and give more side effects of coming off the meds. So I still chose to go rollerblading today because it's sort of a Goldilocks day just right for rollerblading. Not too hot and it's actually going to get really hot here in the next few days and not too cold and it was actually kind of cold and rainy over the weekend so I wanted to take this opportunity but I did sort of just stroll more I didn't really skate too much a lot of its downhill so I just sort of coasted and enjoyed myself and I noticed I didn't have any of that anxiety feeling so that feeling could also be from sitting in front of the computer too much I probably spent eight hours a day on the weekend in front of the screen between editing and making videos and it felt good to get that all done but I'm noticing that being indoors might not be good and they said getting too much sun can be something that makes a person have more withdrawal effects because of how it speeds up the detox process by heating up your body and who knows maybe all that vitamin D goes into action trying to detox things as well so I did spend a few hours in the sun on Friday and I think I did the sprints that morning and then I was in front of a screen and so that could have all contributed to feeling some of that anxiety. So upping the vitamin C, they also said drink more water and I could definitely drink more water. The water here in California is kind of gross compared to where I'm from. So yeah. And another thing that was in that document was menstrual cycle and I was talking to myself about how I could really feel my PMS this last time now that I'm off the meds and it kind of coincided with the exact same time I stopped taking the meds so I'm going to ask them about that next time I talk to them because it says take an extra dose of four vitamins for a week before or something so I'm going to ask them for clarification about that because I could probably use that and they have another product which is greens and probiotics which I might ask them about and also inositol which they said is good for anxiety in that document so I'm gonna ask about that if I'm gonna be on hardy nutritional stuff I may as well keep to their products and go all out with their products well I'm deciding to do that not really muck around not really say oh well I don't really have money for that, I don't really need it. Just try and make this process as smooth as possible. And that document I read said people can have withdrawal effects for months or even a couple of years after coming off. So I think I need to keep that in mind and really reframe anything that I experience as a withdrawal effect and not a symptom of mental illness. It's just a withdrawal effect. And that makes it easier to... to to manage and handle. So it feels good to be outdoors, so I need to notice what it feels good to do. Sitting in my room and just doing stuff on the computer doesn't feel good, but at the same time I do want to finish some of these elements of the dialogue with myself before the 20th. And, and it was interesting that I was talking to myself about inviting in that other voice. And when I was editing my videos, and even when I wasn't editing my videos, just sort of going about my day, all of this stuff was coming through me in terms of this other voice talking about totally different things.
and it seemed pretty insightful to me. It's nothing that I come up with myself, so I see it, I'm like, oh, that seems interesting. And I think I need to keep the video shorter because the internet is being weird here, and making so many videos and then having to wait for them to upload takes a while. So it could actually help to stop talking to myself about the process I'm going through in terms of my decisions about ways to edit videos, but for some reason it just sort of comes out. And and that would be good too for using the photo app instead of YouTube Capture, which is okay, but the photo app only uploads 15 minute videos, at least in the current versions of iOS. And I was looking into getting an Apple Watch and I was looking at the rumors for the next version of the Apple Watch, the, the number three, and, and also a blood glucose meter, which could be good for that um, ketogenic diet testing one day. And it also has something else that sounded cool. But anyways, the point is that I think it'd be cool to have something on my wrist that I can always make calls in case I am in distress. So I might get the two and then upgrade to the three, or I might just wait to get the three. And either way, I'll wait till I get home. So I'm buying the product in my own country so I can return it or whatever if I need to. Or I could get it shipped to California. I haven't decided. We'll see if everything goes smooth this next week. Maybe I will wait, but if not, it could be good to keep an eye on my heart rate. Safety first and ease of this process first and money second. So I'm back at home base now. And the other thing I wanted to say about the withdrawal symptoms paradigm as something to refer one's experiences to. So I think I'm detoxing from that as well. So remembering that there are withdrawal symptoms from the meds and detoxification symptoms is an important thing. It's a transition space. And then eventually when nothing comes up at all, then there's nothing really to think about. And I was reading an article by Dr. Mercola about that high intensity interval. Three minutes of that was equal to 150 minutes of moderate intensity training. And one thing that that video showed that was on that article of his was that there was a rat study where they knocked out a gene that basically made the mice age a lot faster, like twice as fast. But if they had those mutant mice and they ran them on the treadmill three times a week or something, they actually didn't age. So just showing the importance of exercise. So I will try and put that in there. I had a nice skate and it was really fun. I just took my last dose of vitamin C and then I'm gonna make a smoothie and have my last dose of hearty nutritionals. It's kind of late for it, it's going on seven, but that's just the way it worked out. And I wanna do a few minutes of debriefing on all that stuff I read, those things I wrote, and I think they're pretty intense and pretty harsh, but at the same time, there's a lot in there and in those letters, I did mention that the medications and the mental health paradigm seem to end people's lives 25 years early, but I didn't mention that suicide is often a side effect of many medications, so I didn't actually put that part in there. But it's an important point to add. I was emphasizing being afraid of care and that leading to it, but I didn't actually add in that that's often a side effect of the meds, compounded with being afraid of the care and the way people are received. It just really adds to it. And I feel like in a way I'm a voice in opposition of the use of long-term antipsychotics. I think that has a lot to do with the 25 year decrease in lifespan. It kills a lot of people and have that clear distinction of who it's gonna help and who it's gonna harm. I know lots of people on long-term antipsychotics and they're doing kind of okay, but as soon as I am on them, it's very, it's a very fine line between life and death. And sometimes for people, by the time one finds out they have a bad reaction to it, it's too late. So how many people die because the meds make them kill themselves? We can never really know. And that's kind of the trick of it all. 
and oftentimes it's blamed on the person's illness too and not the meds. We don't know what the internal experience of the person was before they ended their life. If I was on those meds and I killed myself, I wouldn't want to. It would just sort of make me. And that's really scary and I don't want meds to kill me. And another point about those letters was that in response to my complaint, I learned that the Advance Directive and Representation Agreement is probably largely crap. So it's a kind of a nice thing to have on hand, but it doesn't guarantee anything. A piece of paper doesn't overrule what the doctor thinks in the whim of the moment. And in my complaint letter, I also said, that's my hope for myself and I won't stop until it's true. And at this point, it's actually true that I haven't been taking medications for over a whole week because my hope was that I wouldn't have to take medications and be a part of the system. And I did make the point in the letter about how recovery is 20 years behind and now I've heard of this person-directed thing and I feel like that's even 20 years behind. Well, it, it was maybe thought of 20 years ago and it still hasn't been implemented, so Recovery still hasn't been implemented, but I think person directedness is different than recovery completely because recovery is still within the confines of the system and sure, it still sort of supports people in their goals by maybe helping them set goals, but so much of the system doesn't actually support those goals. And if somebody had a goal not to be on meds, the current recovery program wouldn't be very supportive of that at all. Not only are doctors reluctant to taper, the strategies aren't out there and a lot of people taper too fast and then it's not successful and then they end up thinking they need meds for life. And not, and people aren't given extra support when they're coming off meds. It's not like, oh, this is really important to you, let's give you extra support. So I think person directedness is something completely different than recovery. It's really about one's whole life, not just recovering a life but recreating a life and I'm saying all this stuff to myself partly because there's so many memes in the mental health system saying seek help take the meds talk to your psychiatrist talk to your doctor about this all the commercials on TV all the anti-stigma campaigns all the different runs for mental health and different things and those are all great and the mental health system helps a lot of people and it helped me for a long time but it's not designed to help me reach my goal of actually transcending it. It's designed to keep me in it indefinitely. So yeah, it's overcoming the memes of the pharmaceutical and the whole medical training and, and all of the, the universities and, and degrees and everything. So all my words to myself are really to move myself out of the vortex of gravity of all those words and memes and people and energy and and money directed at funneling people towards that type of system. And it's full of well-meaning people who really want to help, but it also limits. It limits when it doesn't have any exit plans and exit strategies out of taking all these meds that really limit one's ability to fully feel alive and function in the world the way one would want to. And Whoever wants to take meds forever, that's up to each individual person. And that's the whole point. If any individual doesn't want to, it doesn't mean, oh, stop them tomorrow. It means create very solid plans and ways to move towards that kind of goal. And oftentimes doctors are reluctant because it's on them if something bad happens. Well, if there was proper supports in place and a proper whole whole division of the mental health system to help people actually exit the mental health system completely. And if there's so many divisions helping people get funneled towards it between the police and mental health first aid and all the hospitals and the ambulances and, and even public school systems pointing at people and thinking that they should be funneled towards the system and medical doctors. Well, there should be also strategies to help people get out of that when they want, when it's no longer helpful. So it's a lot of energy to go against and move out of and step outside of. 
and it's not going against the grain. It's going against a vortex, a huge vortex of memes and and energy ready to suck me back in. And I said in one of those letters, I want my 25 years back and I want to support others to do the same. And and it's very true. And I wrote that before I came to California. And when I got to California in February, shortly after I got here, I learned that one of my peer support colleagues passed away. And he was probably in his late 50s. And it really saddened me because he was a very strong advocate. And I had the opportunity to participate in some different dialogues with him present and and he spoke my language and that was the language of changing the language that is used against people and he was very astute and able to pick that out and and very vocal about voicing this kind of stuff so I kind of want to dedicate whatever parts that I talked about that he would resonate with if he if he was here right now to read it and tell me which parts that really resonated with him, I want to dedicate those parts to him. And I do have one more letter I want to read that I wrote to the system in response to the one-on-one -on -one peer support program being dropped in my region. Not the whole peer support program, but the one-on-one, -on -one, which is the meat, the tofu, the tofurkey of of peer support and and I'm pretty sure that if he would read it he would agree with a lot of the things I say and I see him as somebody who lost his 25 years he was in the system and and he didn't get his final 25 years of life and to me that is it's tragic beyond measure I know that he is somebody who wouldn't want to die early and And so I want to read this last letter and dedicate it to him. And it's not the last thing I'm going to read, but it's the last thing sort of towards the mental health system. And a friend of mine actually pointed out a blog post that she posted on her wall on Facebook, and I read it, and it was titled, Rethinking Mental Illness, Are We Drugging Our Prophets and Healers? And... I probably haven't talked too much about that kind of stuff, but I did go to the Revisioning Madness conference, which might have talked a little bit about that, and they gave a photocopy of a poster from, I think, the 60s, and there was a conference called The Value of Psychotic Experience at Esalen, and Alan Watts was there and other people, and Alan Watts actually has a really good clip on YouTube about the value of psychotic experience. And I totally agree with everything that's said in the article. It's on veronica.org. She sounds like a pretty cool advocate. And I was thinking about the word prophet. And actually today, I was writing a little bit, and I wrote down, in response to thinking about how our parents are kind of like our parrots, because they just parrot things to us and expect to sort of take on whatever they parrot to us, and we're supposed to live as a version of them. And I don't think I talked about that yet, but when I wrote that down yesterday, this morning I realized that if we're not parrots, we're prophets, because if we're not just parroting what everybody else is, we're actually sort of a prophet, even if it's very subtle and minor. It's still sort of bringing something to awareness that is unseen, because what's seen is what we keep parroting to each other. And when I wrote that down, and then I looked at the article my friend told me to read, it said, are we drugging our prophets and healers? So it's a good sign to maybe move towards this whole prophetic element of these states of consciousness. And prophecy doesn't have to be this big, unimaginable thing. It's just sort of seeing the implicate order that Dr. David Bohm talks about and making it explicate, making it explicit, and 
doing so through our words and doing so through the perception of our, our energies into words and unfold that. So I will probably read little bits of that later, but I just wanted to talk about that quickly. So here goes the letter. I feel that peer support as it's delivered in the mental health authority is largely tokenism, though it doesn't have to be this way. The peer support worker is not seen as part of the team with its own unique value and contribution. Because of this, it cannot effectively provide the unique value that it has to offer. This myopic view is depriving many people that are struggling from benefit referred to peer support. If someone does get a peer support worker, it's often as a last resort when a clinician is unable to help as opposed to adding richness to a person's recovery team. I feel that with the way peer support is viewed, it's difficult for a PSW to be effective and show one's value when it's hoped by the clinical teams that the PSW will be able to do what they have in mind. Since the clinicians do not understand the role, they have unrealistic or out-of-scope expectations. As there is no dialogue between PSWs and clinicians in the spirit of collaboration of what each brings to the table, PSWs do not have the opportunity to shine. PSWs are expected to be prescriptive and might lean that way in order to appease clinicians, again distorting the role. Part of the PSW's role is not to apply a medical lens. A clinician often passes on diagnostic jargon that can be damaging to the relationship when being told about a new participant. I feel that peer support is not as valuable as it could be if it were delivered within a model that was in accordance with the principles of peer support. If a PSW does have to work within a medical framework, extra care should be taken to ensure a peer support relationship gets off to a good start. Providing peer support in the community is very valuable and allows a person to have time with the PSW one-on-one -on -one to develop a genuine connection through which mutual learning can happen. It would be a tragedy if that dimension of peer support were eliminated as it is possibly the most rich and transformative. I had a peer support worker five years ago who helped me get a volunteer job. Without that one-on-one -on -one help, I don't know if I'd be as far along today. At the time, I was waking up at noon or later and had no routine. By establishing a routine, I then had the confidence to wake up early once a week, which led to waking up for a part-time job on other days. I feel conflicted in that I don't feel there is much psychological safety in working in the community one-on-one -on -one when not supported and valued by the clinical team. I also wonder if they are capable of being supportive or seeing the value. This is doubly disappointing as I would like to imagine that clinicians would be thrilled that a number of individuals have recovered enough to give back and work in peer support. Why are successes within the system not valued and even encouraged to grow by clinicians? If they don't care about PSWs, maybe they don't care about their clients either as PSWs are often clients or former clients. Many don't care enough to refer to peer support. This makes the PSW team feel down on themselves, but not through lack of abilities. How can we show and develop our capacities if not seen as valuable enough to afford these opportunities? Peer support would be more valuable if the referrals came out of the clubhouses. The philosophy of the clubhouses is similar to peer support, and way less energy would be wasted on trying to convince clinicians to see the value. I feel one-on-one -on -one peer support should be delivered out of clubhouses to ensure psychological safety of peer support workers and ensure that peer support can continue to happen one-on-one. -on -one. I have supported people one-on-one -on -one in the community and I end up in the hospital in large part to the subtle ways that the participants I supported were oppressed by the system. I also have co-facilitated a psychoeducation group with a clinician. I found the content disempowering and I couldn't believe that's what sensitive people with a new diagnosis were being told to believe about themselves. I felt completely powerless, and I could imagine how it was making other members of the group feel. There is no way to provide feedback to inform clinical services to be more empowering and sensitive. I really hope that PSWs aren't forced to replace their valuable one-on-one -on -one work with co-facilitating clinical groups that will likely be re-traumatizing and incongruent. 
Putting a PSW in this situation is a form of coercion, because having a PSW there is like saying the material is helpful and lived experience approved. In this situation, a PSW is more like bait for group members to buy into whatever is being sold. It's putting PSWs in a situation to smile and nod through material that is not in alignment with the principles of peer support and has nothing to do with peer support. A PSW would then be a token of the medical model instead of providing unique value and support to an individual in a person-centered relationship. If it is felt that PSWs are not doing a good job at one-on-one -on -one in the community in the eyes of clinicians, then they would do better to move the one-on-one -on -one service base to the clubhouse rather than cancelling one-on-ones altogether. A flower cannot grow in poisoned soil, and peer support cannot flower in unsuitable conditions. We wouldn't say it's a seed's fault for not flowering in poison. We would put the seed in a supportive environment. I feel the only way to ensure psychological safety for PSWs is to be out of the clinical eye, both partnerships and supervision. I feel that my colleagues are amazing and don't even know how amazing they can be if supported to flower. This would benefit so many people that need the importance of the continuance of one-on-one -on -one peer support for the sake of the people who might benefit, as well as changing the way in which it's supported to ensure its success as well as psychological safety. So that's kind of long-winded, and it's a particular case where one-on-one -on -one peer support was dropped in my particular region, and it was shocking to a lot of people. And especially my colleagues who deliver that service and support people and it's a large part of their life and I'm not saying that all clinicians were against one-on-one -on -one peer support and it's very couldn't really belong in the clinical environment at least as it is now if the role was really understood and nurtured and valued and and that perspective of a peer was welcome and invited and asked for and sought out, then it'd be a different story. But it's not that way. So that's not how I feel about it totally. It's just something that I wrote that I just want to share just to get a flavor of something. I don't know what. And peer support is very valuable and I hope that comes across in this letter. And it was very situation specific and it probably didn't do much to write it but that's okay today is my official four months in california yesterday was officially four months since i left for california and since i took the train and it took a long time today is four months since i've been here and so much has changed which i've talked about along the way other changes I've noticed just today is that my face is changing. I've been on meds for six years, so maybe I don't even know what my face is supposed to really look like when the toxins come out of my skin and my muscles and my cells and and the extra maybe bloating or water that would be there along with it. So who knows? I also think my eyes look a bit different. I think that frown mark like this is disappearing a bit as my face relaxes and I've talked about it how it seems that there's changes in the face muscles to go along with how the medications change how one feels which is kind of numbed out and kind of like Err. so I feel a bit lighter through here and through here and who knows and also Yesterday I went to the hot springs and as I was driving there, I heard the voice of my supporter at Hardy Nutritional saying, don't do anything that will make your detox too fast. Let the body do it naturally. Don't lay in the sun too much. Don't go in saunas or get too hot. And there's a heat wave where I am in California and I went to the hot springs last night. So I actually didn't sit all the way in the water too much but I still feel kind of groggy today, like it probably did speed up the detox process somewhat. And during this time in California, I've actually spent a lot of time indoors talking to myself instead of outside in the beauty, but I hope given the process I've been through, coming off my medication and everything, that the time has been well spent and 
working on my relationship with myself and knowing myself has been beneficial. And this morning I was talking to somebody about ozone therapy. And it sounds like I might have the opportunity to try it on Friday next week. But then again, the voice of my supporter at Hardy Nutritionals came in and said, don't do anything that speeds up the detox process. So I'm not sure if ozone therapy speeds up the detox process or if it just supports the detox process. So I might speak to the woman who does this therapy and ask. And it's basically injecting ozone into the veins. So I'm not sure if I'll do it, but maybe I'll do it when I get home because it's about oxygenation and and somebody was describing to me how they felt after and they had more energy. And I've talked at times about the importance of oxygen and how even self-dialogue might increase the oxygen to one's brain because different areas of the brain are being activated and what the brain's always learning and renewing itself. So anything to support that process, I'm kind of curious about. So I might try it, I might not. I'm going to ask if it's something that's advisable for someone with a bipolar label. And it might not be advisable to do it while I'm still in the United States. I might not want to mess with the slow, easy process that I'm going through. But I do want to keep it in mind for one day. So I was trying to look up ozone therapy and bipolar, but I couldn't really find information. But then I stumbled upon a website of this doctor who does intravenous ketamine therapy of all things and beside it is said for bipolar PTSD and depression and I was like what the heck is this I've never heard of this in my life so then I came across a website ketamineadvocacynetwork.org and I was looking at it and I really don't think this is something I'm going to try as I don't really think it applies to me it's for treatment resistant depression and bipolar and things but I was looking in the frequently asked questions part and it says there can be rapid relief lasting several days depending on how people respond. Some people respond to one infusion, some people it takes multiple, some people don't respond at all. So that's not what I'm interested in in pointing this out. What I am interested in is how under the how it works question in the frequently asked questions it says ketamine is completely different from SSRIs etc. The exact mechanism that causes ketamine to relieve depression is still under study and is quite complex. In short, when ketamine is administered in a very precise way, it triggers a cascading sequence of events in the brain, which ultimately results in the regrowth of neurons that previously died off. It is thought by some researchers that prolonged exposure to stress causes these neurons to die off in the first place resulting in depression, but ketamine causes them to rapidly regrow within hours, relieving the depressive symptoms. This is an oversimplification of a very complex topic, and the latest research hints there may be several other mechanisms involved that also play important roles. And then they have a link to their research database. So what I'm interested in here is how they talk about the regrowth of neurons and how in this case, ketamine stimulates that. And I've talked to myself at some point along the self-dialogue about how there's some kind of process involved in bipolar which has to do with regrowth of neurons or, or faster growth of neurons or um, pruning of neurons. And all this I sort of just came upon in my own brain by just talking to myself and making sense out of things from just a little bit of reading on neuroscience and 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 bringing in a lot of different things and and coming up with it through my own insights which just arises through talking to myself and who knows if it's right or anything but I just find it interesting that this ketamine therapy is something that can help people who basically are very often on the verge of suicide due to their depressive feelings or so-called bipolar disorder and it can help those people and so to say that there's a therapy that basically causes the neurons to regrow and that causes relief and that process is what I'm kind of interested in not in necessarily ketamine therapy but I wonder if ozone therapy might help in the oxygenation of 
getting the oxygen to the parts of the body that don't usually get the oxygen because the energy has to go in the brain that might have to do with meaning and, and other parts of life that aren't with the basic biological functioning, those would actually get, those would actually go through a process of dying back first before eliminating brain structures that we need to breathe and all those things. So I just thought it was interesting that it says people take this intravenous ketamine and then their brain cells grow and then they don't feel depressed. So anything that helps to grow brain cells would possibly play a role in alleviating some of this. And I feel in bipolar there's a process of of hyper brain cell growth and then this sort of pruning back of that and that's sort of a cycle of brain growth that could actually be important, sort of like waves crashing against the shore and the tide coming in and out. So it's a different rhythm in the brain than the one that is thought to be normal and consistent. And maybe if we understood it in different ways like this, and I'm not saying that's the only way to understand it or think about it, then it wouldn't be so scary and it wouldn't be so weird and it wouldn't be so abnormal. It's just something different. It's the brain trying to find a different rhythm than the one that we live by in society and is creating all this havoc. And the brain can see that. It's not stupid. It's the seat of intelligence itself. It's it's what intelligence can filter through and even if we're not necessarily operating intelligently because we're just reacting to programs in our conditioning, there's still a small aspect at least of intelligence there witnessing the not so intelligent things happening in the world through our eyes. And it's taken into the collective calculation of humanity and Gaia and and the brain adjusts based on the whole calculation, not just one's little life that we're trying to find meaning in, but the whole thing. And I'm just making that up and I've had a sense of that and I'm not having it necessarily now, but maybe I'm speaking from the senses that I have had through some of my experiences. And those senses and those experiences and those whatever they are want to be given voice to in some way because if it can be integrated, then it actually can be something that is beneficial. So if we know, for example, that we need more oxygen as people who are in these states and get ozone therapy or hyperbaric oxygen therapy or start doing sprints to build our VO2 max or very oxygen specific things like maybe some people can invert or um, lots of different things that can be done for oxygen or actually living in an area where there is more oxygen in the air and it's not so polluted. And so it was kind of fun today to have someone say something and then I looked it up and then I actually found something completely different based on that that I've never heard of before and then just not even looking at it as something I want to do because I don't feel like I have treatment resistant depression or anxiety or or things like that. But it's just interesting to see the similarities and the parallels in different research and things, even if it's just a tiny summary on a page of a particular type of treatment that I'm not interested in. But I'm interested in anything that says that Maybe people that are at the verge of ending their life need something to really jumpstart that, but how do we go with that and build on that? And I feel like we, as people who have a bipolar label, actually need more oxygen. We need more brain growth. It's not just allowing the waves of the brain to grow and go up and down and grow and subside like the tide coming in and out, but us actually intelligently getting with that process to see how can we fill in the gaps in our brain as it's attempting to grow through this natural rhythm. How can we design our life intelligently to to allow the brain not just to grow like this, but to sort of fill in everything else by our daily actions and not actually have the brain grow like this in the cells and we're actually reacting to it and fearing it and, and causing that contraction because we're not understanding what the brain's trying to do and getting with it. So if the brain was sending a signal that led to a feeling of hunger and we were afraid of that feeling of hunger and we were like, oh my gosh, I'm in pain. What is that? Something's wrong with me. Then 
we might not eat. We might not understand what's going on, but the brain is sending signals. And when it's sending signals that make us have certain sensations, which aren't hunger, but they're sensations, we're not understanding what those are saying. It could just be the growing pains of the brain and saying, the brain is growing. And, and, and how do we get with that growth? So if the body's growing and we're an infant and some, and there's the time that comes that it's time to walk, but we just say, well, I'm not going to try walking because I tried once and it didn't work. Well, then it's not going to grow the brain with the action of the body. So there's something happening with growing the brain with the action of the body. And we just don't know what those actions are. It's, it's something like walking or eating, but it's just other aspects of humanity that we haven't really fully understood and come into full embodiment of. And they could be completely new capacities of being a human being that we just aren't aware of. But we can become aware just like a child becomes aware that all of a sudden it has grown enough and developed the neural pathways enough through its playing and chaos and wondering and 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 looking and and then all of a sudden it's it understands that it can take steps and maybe from watching the steps of others but it's also understanding that now this this organism can take some steps so we're not recognizing that there's some steps that we can take there's something that that wants us to move in a certain way. So I feel like lifestyle design factors and, and embodiment factors, and again, harvesting one's mania or experience or harvesting one's altered states to see how that was moving us, to see if we can move that way when not in those states, to move those states into traits. And that would be the same as if the brain was ready for the infant to walk, but it only tried once, it would never develop fully everything it needs in order to walk in every situation. So in the same way, if we are just afraid of these rhythms of the brain after the first time, we're never going to learn what it's trying to give us the sense that we're able to do and look completely different. Instead of spending all of our energy doing XYZ, maybe we have a similar energy, but now we're doing ABC and and maybe that is more fulfilling and and leads to a different unfoldment of life and and the more people are able to do that, a different humanity perhaps. Maybe subtly, maybe in big ways. Who knows? We don't really know and we haven't really given that a chance. We're so busy trying to fix the problem, we don't see that it could actually could be part of the solution. And it's also interesting that I met a very interesting person recently and why it's interesting to me is that this person seems to have gone through some things and and managed to come out the other side without being labeled with anything and still seems to exhibit certain qualities that might actually be called manic like there's this energy and I'm kind of drawn to it because it's sort of the energy that I've sensed before myself, but was warped and pathologized, so I became afraid of it. And even if I'm not really afraid now, I'm still afraid in a way, because if that energy took over and actually was integrated, my life would look different, and I would be different, and and that would be perhaps uncomfortable for people I know. But this person showed up just as a stranger in a strange place, and can be any way and and it's interesting to watch that unfold and it's a little bit magical and and this person sort of asking like what can we create and all these questions that I would have for myself and it's interesting timing again with the clarity I'm feeling and and I see this energy as something that I want to be a part of and that has been a part of me in the past and all of a sudden when I'm off the meds and I'm starting to talk about things happening congruently in reality without having that state. So it's different to have a state of consciousness and be alone in a certain perception of how the world works. Like, oh, it's magical, or I feel so powerful. And then it's another thing for one to feel in a pretty 
clear and, and good state and have those things in reality actually appear as magical. Like a person actually showing up and being like, life is magical and why aren't we living? And, and like, what can we create and things like that? And I'm thinking to myself, these are exactly the questions I have. And this is exactly how I would be. But as this own manifestation of this being, if I was in that state, and so I'm wondering if this person is inviting me into that state, or if I'm to just observe this person in the state and how they've somehow managed to be this way. And it's really fascinating. It's almost like experiencing someone in mania who isn't in mania. And there's it's, it's something that I can't really describe, but the timing is interesting and the and the place and and I've been thinking, oh, I'm going home in a month or so and then I'll go home and blah, blah, blah. And with this person, I just feel like I could be on the other side of the world and never go home. I don't know. So I just feel like my life has possibly taken an interesting turn that I had no idea would show up. And, and I'm in this place where I'm open to things like that showing up possibly. And so I feel like if I don't, if I don't look at that or consider that in some way, I'm actually missing exactly what I'm looking for. And I'm not saying this person is what I'm looking for per se. It's that energy and that aliveness and that vulnerability and that, that wisdom and, and, and I'm wondering if that's like a preview of what could be, except in this version of a human being, in in this human being. And it would still look different for me, but it's just interesting to watch. And then at the same time, I have the holotropic breath lady saying, do everything to stay grounded. Don't do anything to possibly get yourself into an altered state without a safe container. So I have this ozone thing and I'm like, oh, I'm curious, but don't detox too fast. And, and this person that has this energy and I recognize it and I speak that language and I understand. And, and then at the same time, it's inviting me into possibly an altered state. And I think I talked about how the other day I was in a bit of a different dimension, just witnessing this person speak and how they are. And, and then I ate a burrito and I was like, Oh, I need to get grounded. And now this person's here kind of, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. And I really don't know what's going to happen, but I'm very curious. I'm curious mainly like, how did this person pull this off? How were they able to, to go through this and come out the other side and, and not be labeled? And one of the reasons is they were in another country. They were not in a Western country. And this person shared a bit of experience and the whole time I'm just thinking to myself, they would be in a psych ward if that happened here. And there's no doubt in my mind about that. And that didn't happen. So here they are, this embodiment of possibly going through that and finishing with certain things. And and so I wonder, will I have to go through more and and come out the other side or am I out the other side? Or am I kidding myself? Is there still so much more to be done? And I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Here I am talking to myself, thinking I'm just going to talk to myself until I go home and then whatever. And there's people saying, let's create a respite. And I just feel like, like anything could happen. I don't know. And... There's a few more days until I want to wrap up this conversation more about mental health. So I feel like the universe is sending me a message like, look at this individual and look at your life and and what is it that you really want to embody? It's It's interesting, the timing, and everything is interesting. And this person is the one that gave me that insight, not by saying it to me, but just in conversation that life doesn't give up. Maybe life doesn't give up trying to create meaning to create better life. I don't know what it is. And I wonder if we bring up ideas in order to protect them 
and I feel like that's something that I haven't done in this self-dialogue process. I brought up a lot of different ideas and insights, not to protect them, but just to bring up ideas and insights and see what happens. Watch what happens, not try to make something happen. So it's become more about energy, perhaps, and and I wonder why that energy gets labeled and pathologized. And I feel like so-called psychosis could be inner self-talk of the entire universe of Gaia, as well as the personal karma. So it's not just an individual thing. And that's the thing that the process shows, is that we're not individuals and life is not an individual process. We're actually very interconnected. And to me, it seems like there are the speaking about people and the speaking as people. People that are always speaking about their life or speaking about something. And people that just speak as, as the perception of the moment and as that energy of life itself. And it seems like this person that I met is kind of like that. And it's interesting to observe. I'm sort of in this observation phase and just really curious. And, and it's almost like observing the epigesturetics of this person and how they move and, and act and speak and it's really fascinating and it seems like we live in a movement of problems a movement to fix that which the movement of problems created so when we're always going from problem to problem we're living in a continuity of problem and the one who thinks it can solve the problem, separates itself from the problem and thinks it can solve it, but it's actually part of the problem. The problem maker is the problem. So that could be important in realizing that this bipolar process or map consciousness process is not necessarily a problem, but this entity of the ego comes in and makes it a problem and says, well, that's not how it used to be, or that's not have lived my life and and other people and doctors coming in and saying it's a problem when the movement of something other than the problem maker this energy of so-called bipolar could actually be something that is trying to break up this problem maker and it's a different movement of life that once it breaks up the problem maker there might be a movement that doesn't move in problems at all, but just moves with life. Can we move in the discontinuity of creation as opposed to the continuity of problems? And perhaps this creative movement is everything that's not the ego. And that movement is happening, so maybe it's moving in such a way to dissolve that which would impede this creative element that we're all a part of and capable of and that's not separate from us and the non-creative element the ego makes us feel separate and this person said if we grow intelligently it has worldwide effects and that's how we help and that to me just sounded really beautiful and he's really able to express things and I wonder if one day, I might go from expressing meaning to just expression itself. Because meaning still seems to separate from the moment somewhat. Still in retrospect. It's different than just acting on the meaning of the moment, which is translated into action and the meaning is dropped to make room for the next meaning and the next action. And maybe one day that's so fast that, and so infinite that, trying to actually say some of those meanings is meaningless. If there's infinite meaning, then meaning, then meaning itself becomes meaningless in a way. It's like trying to count the molecules in the air in order to breathe. It's not necessary. And I feel maybe when that happens, I'll just speak and I won't look at notes at all.
take notes from the moment. It'll tell me what to say. Not by telling me in a voice or anything, but when there's no separation, there's contact, then something else just speaks. So that's the difference, the speaking about. I'm still speaking about mental illness, and at least for now. And that's the thing, there's no continuity to reality, so I'm living in a different reality right now. And if something happens where I have to take meds again, it's just a different reality altogether. It's not, it's not the same life, it's different. Speaking from this level of consciousness is just a completely different thing. There's no continuity. day before the one year mark tomorrow but I just found it interesting that in my last video I was inviting the magic to come in and it showed itself in a weird way and in my last video the end of it actually showed that there was a knock at my door and it was that new interesting friend of mine and it seems that things have kind of gone full circle and I was talking about full circle since the fly video and being in that sort of magic state sometimes a little bit and being off medication and then this very intriguing individual shows up that is intriguing because he seems to be in a map conscious or magical type state and just observing him I can understand that language just by observing the few things he says and the way he moves around and and things like that so he came into my room and basically to make a long story short I asked him to leave because he wanted to be in a relationship or something and I told him that I can't I I tend to like women and he's an attractive man and if I could go there maybe I would explaining that to him didn't really work and I've avoided explaining that to men at all costs and and the last man that really knew he didn't really care either it's not like oh okay well nice to know he was good to be a friend or whatever it's not like that so anyways he wouldn't leave the room and so I had to emphatically ask numerous times and and when he was sitting on the ground kind of refusing to leave he was breathing in a certain way and saying certain words that reminded me of a past situation and and it was sort of a past situation that is the one that troubled me in January as well but this time it wasn't just that in my consciousness and just trying to go about daily life and it comes up in consciousness but a completely new situation in actual reality which just has parallels to that past situation kind of like that movie Arrival and I watched that recently and I watched it and I was like I wonder if that really applies to any of my experience and it did a little bit but not a lot but now it actually does, now that I think about it, because it's sort of like in the movie where she hears the haptopods making a certain sound in their language, and at the same time she hears the crinkle of a paper of her daughter, or something like that. Yet, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, it turns out she didn't even have a daughter yet, but she was sort of experiencing that future reality. But anyways, I was experiencing the past reality with this reality, but sounds of the past. So 
anyways, that's not important, but what was important in a way was he did leave and and it felt sort of like having the opportunity to say, go, like, I don't want you here, go. I don't need you. And he sort of wanted me to join him in that magical dimension and wanted to pull me through that portal in a way. And... And I don't know, I just felt like he didn't listen to me, what I was saying. Like, I can't, sorry. And and besides that, I've already been through that portal. And it's been a long journey to sort of walk in both worlds. And now I'm in the process of wanting to walk in both worlds, not just that mystical and magical world, because it's very ungrounding and so that clue I got from that lady who said stay grounded well I'm choosing to stay grounded and and he also said something about making an analogy of a woman not giving the time of day to a man because of past experience and that she shouldn't necessarily do that it's not really fair to the man he didn't say it like that he gave a different example but to me, that's what made me feel like I don't want to talk about this anymore. I don't even want to explain it anymore. Just get out because I'm sorry, but men haven't walked a day in a life of a woman in the constant fear. And that's not fair to say. And I don't agree. One second. And in a perfect world, maybe that would be possible, but it's not. And and I don't want to go on and on about it, really. I could, but I don't want to. And I feel it's possible I'm somewhat healed from that experience that just happened now. And, and I feel like I'm in that place again before this all started when I went rollerblading and I fell asleep under a tree. And I woke up and I felt so calm and so relaxed. And things changed after that. But I feel like I went full circle back to the fly video, which was before I was labeled. And now I've almost gone full circle back before any of this all started. And I don't know if that's true. But I tend to talk about things in advance of them being true. And that's part of the process is talking that possibility into existence because talking about possibilities the brain resides in possibilities and perhaps speaks the language of possibilities and responds to possibilities as opposed to saying this is my narrow goal and I want to reach it and that's all I want and not being able to see anything and missing out on the rest of life so it feels symbolic in a lot of ways and I feel quite calm and I was able to talk to a friend after for an hour who was right there to support me and before I didn't really have that support back when I needed it when I was going through all that stuff before I was labeled I didn't have that support and so it led to being labeled and getting the support of the system and having to move through all of that and I think I talked about in a recent video about how that's given me so much to to see and to be able to to inform me what to create moving forward and and I said that to myself in a very recent video I said well what am I going to do with this is the real question being off meds and it's not necessarily about helping people with supposed mental illness because that's just a consolidation of everything else that's going on and so I'm seeing that, but I'm not allowing it to necessarily re-traumatize me at this point, just inform me. So in the video I actually watched of myself from October and November, I did mention ekphoric sensation, which I learned about from Dr. Daniel Siegel. And I feel like just hearing that term yesterday for myself helped me today in that I realized that there was some stuff from the past, but it had ekphoric sensation. I realized that 
those sounds were from the past too, but I wasn't allowing that to stop myself from being present with what was happening right now and stand firm in, in what I felt. And also, there's a passage by Krishnamurti I once read that says, there is a reality when coming upon the mind transforms it. You don't have to do a thing. It operates. Something like that. And then later on it says, no authority can give it to you. No religion, no guru, no this, no that. And when you see that, when you see that nobody can give it to you, you have it. And just a little while ago, I realized that. I sort of thought of that and how this person was sort of trying to bring me to enlightenment or give me enlightenment or give me that state. And and I didn't want it and I don't want it. And it's partly because I'm not seeking, I'm not looking for anything. I feel more in touch with that which looks not something that that which looks is looking for. There's nothing in particular. So it could be anything. It could be this person offering enlightenment and feeling like that's something I need or looking at a beautiful rose. It's just there. And again, I could be talking in a different way at some other point, but I felt like sharing this with myself and just acknowledging that something really happened there. And, and again, not necessarily going back. That happening didn't make me go back, but it also helped to answer, what am I going to do with this? A little bit and and it offered more clues to what I'm need to be doing and yesterday watching those videos and again seeing the dream center project and and seeing that perhaps helping to create safety for women like I have this idea that I don't see why the Apple Watch can't have some kind of safety feature for women, even if it's a gesture of how one moves when when being attacked or or something can alert people that someone needs help. Somebody can create that app or somebody can create that. And there are things that are created, but it was something that was just integrated into something so many people already have instead of some kind of bulky thing here or there. And in my last video I was editing and I said something about if I can go back or when I go back home. But at first I said if I can go back and I felt like what was that about if? Was I saying if I can go back and do such and such or if I can go back as a slip? I wonder if I can go back and I, I, I will go back. Maybe it just means I can't go back the way I was, or I don't know. I really don't. I feel, I feel calm. I feel, I feel healed, and I don't know if that's true. But I remember Dion Vimal saying something about, and then you're utterly healed, and that's sort of what arose in my brain was. You're healed, and and also that thing with the Krishnamurti quotes, when he says, when you when you realize that nobody can give it to you, you have it. And this person was trying to offer it to me, and I was feeling like you can't give it to me. Maybe because I feel like I already have it, and I don't know what that it is. But at the same time, maybe I kind of had it six years ago and that magic was transformed into a so-called mental illness and I've had it all along it's just been not as prominent and I feel 
too that I don't need to purposefully make it super prominent. It's still there, it's still operating in the background. I don't want to always see it and be aware of it. And it's related to that quote I read by Dion B. Mull as well saying about that magic and how he talked about the magic. This is your magic, it's the real you, the you that never dies. And I feel like when a person comes in contact with that magic, that magic always continues and and it's something that is difficult to explain and I don't really know what I'm talking about I just felt that I wanted to share this with myself as it's really interesting that this happened and and I feel this sense of healing like resolving things from the past and and feeling alone in a good way like I don't need anybody and in that I can really possibly meet people because I don't need anything from anybody this person seemed to want something from me and I don't want anything from him I don't want anything from anyone really And perhaps because I've done a lot of this myself, and I haven't done it myself. There's been a lot of support, but the part that I know other people would have a hard time supporting, such as, I'm going to go off meds in California. I've just gone about that process myself. And of course, with the support of Hardy Nutritionals and the micronutrients. And I got my new shipment of Hardy Nutritionals micronutrients and the amino acids and I also got the probiotic which is good timing because yesterday I had gut issues for sure so I'm really grateful for the process I'm really grateful for the space I've had here in California and the people that I've met and Hardy Nutritionals and everyone back home who is asking when are you coming back and my family, of course, and this process of self-dialogue, this process of talking to the iPhone processor and having a unbiased witness, just witnessing this process with myself and being able to witness it by editing the video and it's just interesting timing that the very last day I feel like something big has healed and I wonder if there'll be any kind of follow from that or aftermath because even when I was in California six years ago I met a very powerful man and I I left and after I left things went downhill and it's not about the powerful man it's about that high state of consciousness and and being there with someone and being in that state and that actually brings that other being of a certain consciousness to you so knowing that I sort of did that again brought a being of a certain state of consciousness into my reality I wonder if that's the ceiling I think I was talking about what's the ceiling when will I hit the ceiling and I feel very calm Yet, like, that might have been the ceiling. Not the ultimate ceiling, but the ceiling before I might fall. And that's often what happens. I'm doing pretty well, and then things fall. And then I have to pick up the pieces and go through that whole process and perhaps medicate myself, and I don't want to do that. And maybe some of the calm is actually from taking the micronutrients. I think I took five vitamin C again today just because of the extra distress and and the micronutrients and the amino acids and we'll see I feel like I have pushed away somebody very very 
who speaks that language of map consciousness and I wanted to speak that language of map consciousness and and observe but but I guess it wasn't meant to be and maybe there was no recognition on the other person's part that I speak that language I get it it's taken me six years to move from that chaotic state through the mental health system and out the other side and I'm not about to go back to the highest point I'm just going to keep moving at the pace that I'm moving which is kind of the pace of talking to myself and the next steps are healing if there's any more healing and I'm sure there is but I feel the healing is actually in creating something that heals and that's the other thing is this person seems to need some rest and some some support and care as he might be trying to do too much and I've been there trying to do too much in that first experience in map consciousness trying to save the world trying to save people and and when one tries too hard, one falls really hard. And I think at one point I was talking about making the effort to be effortless. And and can life be effortless? And sometimes I feel like I'm in the effortless place. And to make an effort actually moves one away from being in touch with what one feels one is making an effort for. And every effort presupposes that we know what we want, what we're looking for. But that's projection, usually from our past, so... Yeah. And maybe the projections of my past prevent me from seeing a being who... who could have brought some kind of enlightenment or something but again nobody can give it nobody can bring it to anyone and maybe that's part of that state where one feels like one can really bring it for other people but one can't people have to see it for themselves and that's also why I talk about I don't know if I can help anyone I don't even imagine I can or want to try to that's more just a way of expressing it in words but the actuality is I don't know if anyone can help anyone but maybe that energy can and I feel like the energy this person brought was helpful but maybe not in the way that he was hoping I feel stronger like I don't need anybody and part of that has been this self-dialogue process if I can talk to myself for an entire year and talk myself through all of this why why do I need somebody to all of a sudden come in and and bring chaos and change things I don't and if somebody arrives in my reality and can't see that then they just can't actually see they just think they can and I don't know if that's true I'm just talking I'm just talking from a place of strength in areas I have not felt strong. And I just wonder if it'll last. I guess that's yet to be seen. It feels like it's possible that now that I'm off the meds, Little bits that I need to process may come up here and there, like they did today. Instead of having the meds suppress it, and the bits can't come up, so the bits start accumulating over time. And that, to me, is the accumulation of the allostatic load, that eventually the meds just don't actually protect from that anymore, and it just bursts through the chemical protective layer of medication that is trying to suppress these these elements that the brain is trying to process 
It would be like trying to stay awake all the time because one is afraid of nightmares. It's impossible and that's just going to create more nightmares. So it feels like maybe now with the Hardy Nutritionals and being off meds, things will come up for processing, but it won't be this long period of medication suppressed processing bits accumulating in an allostatic load that eventually breaks through what the medications are able to suppress and then all comes into consciousness at the same time. And the other day I was talking about how I was noticing words sounding vulgar and that's usually something that happens when I'm in the worst so-called psychosis. So to notice that yet not feel like I'm in psychosis, it's like I've gone from psychosis to just noticing and noticing that it has ek fork sensation that's from the past and when I notice that I feel like then the hippocampus can put it in its right place in the brain because if we're not noticing it we're we're just letting it interfere with our reality instead of noticing it integrating it into the brain and then also utilizing that information to actually inform one's life moving forward. So it's not just integrating the memories, but that process actually moves one in a different way that will help move one towards what one needs to do next. And perhaps I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow if something arises, but for now, I'll leave it at that. I'm grateful for the magic. I'm grateful for this process I've been going through. And maybe it's only a process that could have happened in California away from all those other energies that are there and would would tell me not to do this. And and I've done it and I've done it myself and by my own volition and also the participation of the universe. So I'm grateful for the universe. The universe is on my side and I'm on the side of the universe and it's just two sides of one coin.